that are doing this, some of the raters that are doing this, and even the ratings firms. So any comments and all the comments you give are gonna be super helpful for us in just thinking through this and how to tackle these issues. Some that I mentioned kind of going forward. So we're really looking forward to getting those. What I'm planning to do is just to present to you kind of what we've gotten so far, where we're sitting so far, and then hopefully we get that done early so that I can open it up to more q and comments. So where have we gotten so far? So I don't think this needs much of a motivation, but ESG is, it's a thing, right? And not only is it a thing, but it's a thing being used by lots of asset managers and asset management worldwide. And so how much, well look, it has grown to be about 33% of the $50 trillion US AUM and incrementally, so marginally, over 50% of assets worldwide, the best estimate from last year, had some kind of impact tag to it, right? ESG or impact tag. Now, how have they done this? Well, there's really been kind of two ways that these assets have been allocated. There have been these ESG ratings, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit here, and also these divestiture campaigns. The divestiture campaigns, they have this feel for, hey, look, we don't like X, whatever X is. These could be sin stocks, this could be alcohol, tobacco. We're gonna to talk about energy here. And so we're just gonna prevent our portfolio from investing in those types of stocks. Now, what's the motivation for these types of investment rules? Well, look, we could have a preference-based motivation. So that is just, we don't like something about this and we want our investment dollars to represent this. And we're totally cool if that means we get a lower risk-adjusted return, right? If for you to do that, and that's either because you have to minimize this kind of search space or it just takes longer, search costs are higher, so we'll pay higher fees for that. Or there could be some kind of belief-based approach here. And that is even if I don't care about ESG, if I think others care about ESG, other important factors of production here, you can think about labor, employees, or consumers, and that would drive them to certain types of firms and not to other types of firms. And I don't think that the market is fully impounding that, then I might want to invest this way, even if I don't care about it in particular. So what's the evidence on this? Well, it's kind of mixed kind of goes both ways. So there's not great evidence, not really super surprising, given that there hasn't been that much time where these have been going on. And so keep this date in mind, the term ESG, the term ESG actually didn't come about until 2004. There was a UN report that established it, but we just don't have that big of a time series to establish these things. Some tests show that there's a little bit of outperformance, a little bit of underperformance, and it really is kind of the middle. And the same on the corporate side, who've, who've applied these. So some kind of good, some kind of bad, but we're sitting some in some kind of kind of uncertain space as far as that's concerned. So what do we do in the paper? Okay, what we do in this paper is we say, hey, look, on this environmental piece, right, the E of the ESG, what everyone can agree on, kind of worldwide that wants to solve this problem, is we're not there yet. So whatever solutions we need, the most recent report stressed things like carbon capture, we need future technology. Right? And you can think about that on the call side, but also the innovation production, distribution, storage side, right? We just need more innovation. And so innovation is going to be a key component of whatever the solution space is going to be moving ahead. And given that, in the paper, we're just going to investigate, gosh, who is it that does this innovation? Who's done it over time? And who's done it that And how does that look like with respect to where money has been flowing? and how these great curves, how these kind of engines in between have been putting that capital to work. Right? So the idea is, this is, we're at a super cool time with that a ton of capital in the world, right? and that the world of capital is really excited about it. We want to have energy to keep the hand for trying to put the capital to work in this way, and then we have this machine that turns that capital into outcome, and so we're asking, gosh, how is this machine working? This is just one way it does it, and one component that is quite important, especially in this environmental piece. So here's what we find. 
we find that a large fraction of green patenting isn't driven by highly rated E firms. So this is E in the ESG space. Um, and these are firms that are commonly favored by ESG funds. Um, and the firms that are kind of pushed into by those, those divestiture campaigns and the ones that are pushed away from, but instead it's the energy sector. So the traditional energy sector that has been a large and growing percentage of these ESG patents and of their patenting activity more broadly. Think about this at the firm and industry level. So they allocate significantly more of their innovation efforts toward green innovation than other firms that are also active in this green innovating space. So significantly more than other highly rated E firms, right, in the ESG space, and more than other sectors who again are also active. How much more? Well, on average about three times more. So the average firm in these industries that does green patenting, does about 8% of their patenting for energy firms that's about three times as high. So it's about 22%. Now, not only do they produce these patents, but our next question was, gosh, they may produce patents, but they may produce kind of like easy layouts, like crappy patents, right? So they want to make it look like they're patenting, but they're like, look, we're not going to spend as much time on these. We're just going to put some numbers on them. And so we then move to explore the quality of these patents. And it turns out that the quality of these patents by the markers of quality that we have in this space look like they're actually higher quality patents. How do you measure that? We'll first use this measure of citation, which is often here for you, but there are issues with this given the skewness of the distribution. So this other measure that's often used are these things called blockbuster patents. And that just means a patent that gets the most citations within its kind of vintage and technology class in that year. And those have been shown to be the patents that are most commercialized. The products that the world uses. And it turns out they both have significantly higher cited patents, right, per patent, and they also have more of these blockbuster patents coming from these traditional energy firms. But even given that, we were thinking, well, gosh, maybe they're still trying to be strategic in the way that they patent these, in the sense that they are restricting others from commercializing in the space. So what is a patent? Well, by construction, a patent is actually a defensive legal contract. So what a patent does is it allows me right, to define a space where I can block any other commercialization from happening to that point of view. And so I can block a meal from commercializing the space. Now I don't need to do anything myself. I can just let me grow up there, I don't have to commercialize that space. So maybe what they're doing is strategically blocking out these spaces that they know are valuable and they just don't want anybody else to use. Right? And I can do that either through the patenting itself or through the creation of this thing called patent space. So this comes from the pharmaceutical industry. And the idea is that we have a bunch of intertwining patents that make it just super hard to cut through that density and the patent is even near the idea of the space. So we find no evidence that they're actually using these thickets. And so we measure this in the space. And their patents themselves, we then look at who's citing them. Right, because this could be one of these issues, right, where you'll get someone up on screen, right, like a, an author discuss it, and they'll say, Oh, the most influential work here is all mine, right? And I'll say, I'm self citing your thing. And that's what we were worried about here is that maybe all those citations are coming from the firms themselves, right? Like Royal Dutch Shell are just citing their own patents, and that's what's generating this. And this turns out not to be the case, right? Three quarters of their citations are coming from outside. of the citations for other alternative energy firms are coming from outside their industry. Okay, so comparatively speaking, these are actually more impactful outside the industries than other alt energy, than other green energy patents. And um, we do find some evidence you know, that, that on the incentive margin, they get less credit in terms of incremental ESG score and E score in particular, even given that they're producing these more and what seem like have markers of higher quality patents. So then I think the, the big and main question and it's kind of made this as you ask is look, this is all great that they're producing these patents, but are they putting their money where their mouths are doing, right? So are they still just producing these ideas but not putting money behind them? And so in order to do this, we have to take a look at the dollars that put it behind them. And so what we find is that first, they were some of the earliest and foundational innovators in this space. So we 
count was going back to the 19th century, 1978 by the Exxon research team. And this is one of the foundational patents in solar cell technology. Okay, this is what green patenting has looked like over the past now 40 years, going back to 1980. Okay, so we see it's been rising, probably not surprisingly. And I'll show you what percentage this, these oil majors have done. And so I don't think anyone can read this table. So the things in yellow, are these the top 50 firms, publicly traded firms that patent here? The firms in yellow are traditional oil firms. Okay, so these are your BPs and your shells. And as an industry sector, they're the second most green patent intensive producer behind manufacturing. Manufacturing here is going to include things like car companies, right? Or DuPont, who are also big producers here. And this is really our headline result. And so again, I'm just going to kind of talk you through it at the industry level, but just so you can understand what we're putting on the left-hand side here is the green patent ratio. So that's the intensity of all the patents you produce, what percentage are green here, right? So if you are produce 100 patents and 40 of them are green, that's going to be 40%. And so what we can see here is that when we include all the controls, industry-level controls, things for like scale, things for age, other things we think might matter here, doesn't really make a difference. These energy industry firms just produce significantly more of their intensity, of their idea space. They're dedicating more time and effort, and will show in terms of dollars to green patents. And how much more? Well, like I mentioned before, about three times more. 
They're putting about three times more of their efforts into this. And I want to show you one other uh, result with this, and that is when we focus specifically on some of these frontier technologies that were brought up in these recent ICPP reports and some of these others, things like carbon capture, it turns out some of these magnitudes get even larger. Okay, so there they're not investing three times as much, but it can be three to five times as much in these types of alternative energy and kind of carbon capture technologies. And so when we jump now to look at impact, right, the quality of these patents, we find something that I mentioned before, which is we were a little surprised by it turns out on average, these are higher quality patents that are being produced. So it doesn't look like they're just running up the numbers here, but higher quality, how much higher quality will they get about 10% more patent citations per patent on their green patents. And they're about three times more likely to be blockbuster patents. Okay, so that moves it from about that five ish percent up to about 15%. And the last thing I want to talk about is the actual amount that they're investing. Okay, so this still brings up this question, right, that we talked a little bit about is, hey, is this just cheap talk or are they investing real dollars behind this? And so it turns out we find evidence that it's the latter, that in fact they are some of the largest producers of alternative energy watches in the world. And they really have been since the beginning of this, as we can see in drawing. And again, something that maybe you shouldn't be surprised by, right? They're incented to do exactly this. But we see this being measured by just the amount of wattage they're doing and the number of low carbon projects, right? And kind of carbon capture projects and carbon abatement projects. We can measure either in that equal weighted terms number of projects, the amount of CapEx that they're putting in here, CapEx dollars and also in wattage, right? So all those three measures of kind of money where your mouth is. Um, and so we see that in, in other measures of these two that try to measure. So this is uh, something that came out that was estimated by Raymond James. We see it across all of these different measures of kind of real money that we've put in. So the takeaway. So thus far, look, we found a number of authors that or in the GSP rankings, getting very low rankings on the E, seem to be the same firms that are producing this factor, this innovation that we're going to need to solve this problem. So we think that's an intriguing and maybe a little bit of, of an odd relationship that we want to dig into more. Okay? So they seem to be not only investing more into this, but investing in the higher quality output that have been realized, and that's not benefiting that. And so, given this, right, and stepping back, this is the team that produced that solar cell technology. And so, given this, our big takeaway is that, hey, we think that this structure, the system allows instead of advancing, saying, okay, you can be part of the solution on this side of the room, and everybody over here, we don't want you, you can't be part of the solution. Perhaps some ex post structure where we go for those who do have And so, you know, we're aligning 